Okay, actually, I wanted to just tell you that uh, the word activist is very alien to me. Okay, in, 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 when, when we were young, in 16, 17 years old, I mean, we, yeah, upper itu, activist, I mean, never occurred to us. <laughs> also, I want to put in a context, in those days, we don't have uh, your internet and things like that. I grew up in a period where you don't have opposition members in parliament for a long time, from 1968 to 1981. So the information we get are all very beautiful stories all the time. The official narrative is like that. And uh, I, I went to the Singapore Polytechnic in 1976, and I consider myself an aberration in the sense that because I grew up in a period where my family can see progress, you know, economically and all that kind of thing, and I was English educated, so how did the political awakening happen to a person like me? So the first thing that shocked me was on the eve of the student council elections, my seniors were arrested under ISA. That was the first time I heard of ISA. Why is that? Why were these people arrested under ISA? So that, that actually shocked me into thinking that, hey, how come I didn't know that these things happen? And why didn't anybody say anything after that incident happened? So this started your questioning of your assumptions of what you have been listening to. Right. Okay, for me, after that incident, there is a sense of uh, injustice that has happened to my fellow students. So, of course, because I knew some of them, so I stood up for student council elections. And I wanted um, to show some of the things that influenced my thinking after that. Of course, in the students' union, you started to become aware that there's a role for you to play in the students' union because you need to take care of the students' welfare and things like that. But there were a lot of things that were happening around our region that shaped our thinking as well at that time. Um, can I have the slides uh, that were, yeah? Can I just? Right arrow, oh my God. Yeah. Okay, I'd just like to share that these are the sum of the information that came through when we were students. Okay. So, during that period, we realised that there were no independent voices as such. There were no trade unions or free press, and uh, our students' union, we discovered, were the only autonomous bodies at that time. So what does that mean? That means that we could actually issue press statements without having to go to the admin for permission, you know. We just had a meeting and then we just issued a press. But of course, the Straits Times may never carry your press statements like, anyway. Then we started to receive in, in, um, like newsletters and information about the students' movement in the region that were happening at the same time. So we read about the Thai students. They were involved in uh, fighting for democracy and there was a military junta, you know, there was a coup and a lot of the student activists actually died in campus. So we say, hey, how come the students are involved in this kind of issues? Why were they involved? So, and then we read about, in Malaysia, there was the Baling hunger strike and the students went to support the people who were actually involved in all this. And Pase Itara was a squatter issue that, that people lost their homes and the students again went to support, to speak up for them. And in Indonesia, even, uh, the students called for a boycott of Japanese goods when Tanaka visited them because of all these uh, problems that they were facing economically. So, where did our news come from? It's definitely not from the Straits Times, but because the student organisations were affiliated to other international organisations, we received publications from the various sources. So you can see all these images from the Asian Students Association, where they actually showed pictures like that. It's like massive movement by the students. You can see the pictures that, that the students were killed 
and marches and all that. And under Marcos in the 1970s, you know, the people were asking for more freedom and things like that. So the, all these are the images that we receive. And of course, it made you question why? Why all these things are happening? And then at that time, the University of uh, Singapore Students Union, they still had their publication called The Undergrad. And these are some of the issues that they were working on. Of course, the famous uh, trial was uh, the Tan Wa Piao trial. He was charged for rioting. And that was another big event for us as 16 or 17 years old. Even we did not understand fully what was happening, but you felt that something was uh, not right. And in the Students' Union in the Polytechnic, we were also busy with our own uh, internal issues. At that time also, the students became very aware of uh, what is happening in the region and even locally. And uh, there were a lot of joint uh, events that the Polytechnic and the University of Students were working on um, collecting uh, flood relief things for the Bangladesh people and all that kind of thing. And uh, of course, the anti-bus fare hike that uh, the students were involved in. Like today, a lot of the students here may enjoy so-called bus concessions this bus concession was fought for, for, for you many, many years ago when the students in the university and polytechnic were fighting every year when there was a bus fare hike. So nothing is given on a platter like this. They have been fought for, for generations eh, before all these were given. So these are all some of the summaries of things that we were issued, uh, we were all interested in. Uh. Like, the, for example, in the university in the 1970s, when there was retrenchment, it was the university students who set up the research, uh, res retrenchment research centre, and they were the ones who actually had a survey and uh, did uh, what can be done and things like that. Because, don't forget, there were no such thing as civic organisations at that time. And for us, as student activists, uh, actually we did not know who to turn to uh, for advice or whatever. Imagine 17, 16, 17 year old and you're running an organisation and uh, you just do not know okay, what to do and all that. You're just uh, you know, like hitting a wall most of the time. Uh, because the whole layer of so-called activists were either deported or detained and you just do not know who else to turn to. Oops. So, so, the official stories that we have at that time, oh, sorry. <laughs> at that time were all the, the, good, the good stories that we always hear. But once you are hit by all these issues that are facing you, the beautiful story that has been given to you are all shattered. And there were a lot of questions that you have. Where do, you, where do you find alternative stories that, hey, actually, what happened? But who are going to tell you the stories? We don't have mentors that come and tell you, oh, actually, this was what happened. You rely on publications that are given to you and all that. So you read from there. Right. So one of the questions given was, what was the narrative that we were trying to fight against? Actually, most of the time, we were just trying to tell people that the students' union is fighting for our own independence because there was a lot of attempt to reconstitute the union and uh, the polytechnic administration was just trying to curtail your rights to organize by not giving you like classrooms. Like today, you see, we are very lucky we can get, we use this room. But in the past, everything was no, you cannot organize anything in the campus. It was always a no. So there were a lot of obstacles given to the students' union to organise. They are not going to collect your union fees. No, they are not going to give you back whatever they have collected. So it's always a no. So they are just putting obstacles like that. So half the time you're fighting on all these kind of mundane issues instead of talking about 
what, uh, what the students can do, what kind of welfare and all that. It's putting obstacles after obstacles. But having said that, it also gives the students the opportunity to organise themselves, to come together and then face the issues together and then they, what do we do next? Like today, when your students' organisations are all controlled by the administration, everything you do, you have to go to the admin and say, can we do this? Is this approved? Now what does it mean? It means that a lot of students at the peak of their intellectual development are still treated like, like primary school kids or secondary school kids. You do not have your own ability to decide that, okay, this is good for us, this is what we should do. And I think we are seeing the impact today politically because when there's an issue, let's say the Ghana Contempt uh, Amendment Bill, how do people get together to discuss what is right or wrong that we feel for Singapore? How many of us really come together to say that, hey, we have to do something. This is not right for us. I think that that part has really a big impact today on how we organise ourselves. So, when you ask how effective has the official story been for me, I think that it has been very, very effective for many, many people who have not gone through any activism or being faced with issues that they work on. Because if you're a Singaporean and all your lives you have been uh, seeing very good economic progress and all that, you will still believe that, hey, Singapore is really uh, a beautiful place and uh, it's sort of a paradise. As I was uh, sharing with somebody just now, for Singapore activists, when you go outside and uh, you see that a lot of your neighbouring countries are facing like military coup, uh, terrible tortures of political prisoners, or even people dying for their beliefs, they will look back and say that, hey, look, Singapore is so beautiful, no? Everything works, no? Why are you complaining? So for activists like myself, it's always... When you give a different narrative that we have ISA, you know, people are detained without trial. And people, in the past, people have been in prison for 30 year, over years, you know. And people don't know that. They say, huh, how come these things happen and nobody talk about it? So it becomes a, a very difficult story to say that Singapore is a rich country and there are still people griping that Singapore is no good and all that. Because I think the subtleties of oppression that we face cannot be seen by a lot of people because I think the official story is beautifully done. When you come into the airport, everything is beautiful, green and all that. Everything works, so you know you should have nothing to worry about or complain about. You, you don't see the inequality or injustices that affect some people in Singapore. So I will stop my story here and then uh, maybe we have more time to discuss the little, little stories that you can ask. Thank you.